Welcome, friends, family, believers in Jesus Christ. And maybe if you're not a believer in Jesus Christ yet, I hope you're seeking and walking in that direction where you are weighing the evidence, seeing what's happening in the world and understanding that someone already came and paid for all the sins that you have ever committed or will ever commit. And by his shed blood, you can be redeemed by believing in him, by having faith, by placing your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. I hope you're here too. Certainly, fellow rapture heads, welcome. I'm glad you're here. I'm Jimmy. If you didn't know already, really doesn't matter what my name is. What we're looking at is the name of Jesus. We are, we are glorifying the name of Jesus. That's what is important. Now, it's cool in these days that we get together on a platform like this, and we don't know when it could be taken away could be taken away at any moment. But there's a platform here where we can we can uh, study the Word of God together in many platforms like this. And, um, and I see a lot of you in the chat. When you come into this chat, it's not uh, unusual to see you in the chat of, of other uh, brothers and sisters' channels. Um, you know, you, it's fun to talk with you there, too. And we kind of recognize each other in many ways because we are fellowshipping together which is cool because we're kind of called to do that. And I know many of you haven't been able to find a Bible-believing, gospel-preaching church nearby you where you and your family can fellowship together. And the Lord has somehow, some way for this reason and this day and this time provided uh, an online platform where you can hear, study the Word, worship together. Uh, I know nothing replaces face-to-face, but we're all going to see face-to-face soon, 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 I say, soon and very soon we shall see the king. We'll be there together. And what a fellowship that will be. What a day that will be. When my Jesus I shall see. Old hymns just come to mind right now. But anyway, I want to go to this passage of Scripture just to confirm this. This is Hebrews chapter 10, starting at verse 19. Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, not your works, not your good looks, not your incredibly brilliant mind, but by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he consecrated for us through the veil, that is his flesh, you have the blood and the flesh, you have the wine and the bread. I'm not even going to go to the new wine teaching tonight, but wow, it's, it's kind of right there behind the scenes. And having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in what? Full assurance of faith. Not partial. Full assurance of faith. Mm. Having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. Wow, no waffles. No waffles. No waffling, no wavering. Full assurance, full assurance, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some or the habit of some, but exhorting and encouraging one another, and so much more as you see the day approaching. Wow, do you see the day approaching? I know you do. So, we get to assemble together, and that's so cool. I can't wait for the, the big assembly. You know, the Lord always calls to the big assembly. There's the, there's the, 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 um, the calling together of the sacred assembly, and, and we're coming together in sacred assembly soon, soon and very soon. I'm not going to go through that all again, but I, um, there's so many things that are happening, so many things that we could talk about, and um, the Lord's stirring in my heart several things that I haven't been able to peg down. And, you know, I'm in conversations with many of you, some, some great conversations this last, uh, this last week have taken place. I just can't tell you how encouraged I have been t- uh, talking by phone with several of you. Um, wow. Uh, what an opportunity that has been. And, uh, where we haven't met physically yet on this earth, the, the, the cellular network has connected us together, but we're connected through the Holy Spirit. So we've been able to uh, communicate uh, in, in some really special ways, and I appreciate that so much. And those of you who, uh, y- you know who I'm talking about, 
the rest of you right here, we get to communicate in so many ways. But the reason is the Lord's bringing us together. It really is. He's bringing us together. We see judgment happening in the house of God. Yes. But we also see a unity coming together in, in, uh, in the remnant, I'm going to call it, in the, in the body of Christ that is truly believing that we are saved by grace through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and that we are looking for that blessed hope, that soon appearing of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ. We're, we're looking, we're, we're watching, we're studying, we're deep diving so many puzzle pieces are coming together. We're, we're entering into the season of new wine, all of these things. And yet at the same time, the world is, is quite literally going into the fry pan. It's out from the fry pan out to the fire, actually, is what it's going into. There's so many things happening. We have such a nutty election cycle happening. I mean, oh, I could talk about that. I won't. Could talk about lots of things. I'm not going to do it. Could talk about Israel. Could talk about what we see here, what we see there. Give a lot of opinions. Give a lot of speculations. And yet, what good does it do? If many of you watching many YouTube channels are in a state of a, a state of alarm right now, then I don't want to add to your alarm. I, I want to do the opposite. And I think the Lord would has challenged me to do the opposite for this particular study. To to bring assurance from the word of God, not alarm at the state of the world and and you know how close we are to the tribulation because we're like a, a blink and a baseball bat away from the tribulation. It's just going to be a blink and you're going to get hit with the bat and we're in the tribulation, but we're not. And we're not going to be. I want to give you the full assurance from the scripture. And um, I've, I've been reading and studying in a passage, and I want to walk through this. This is... A, <laughs> Don't be alarmed. Don't be alarmed. This is the entire Psalm 69. It's a wonderful psalm, and I want to walk through it and emphasize some bits and pieces so that you will have full assurance. You have the assurance in these days of alarm, that you have rest in the days of the helter-skelterness of it all and the frenzy and the chaos that is happening. Every, you of all people, we of all people should have the full assurance by faith that he who promised is faithful. He's going to fulfill it. He's going to do what he said he's going to do. And all evidence shows soon. And so we don't want to participate in the alarm. We don't want to be the ones who are wringing our hands and fretting over evildoers and everything that's happening. Yes, they're out there. This is, this is the, these are the days of Noah. These are the days of Lot. We've studied these things ad infinitum. We are in the days of peril, perilous times, but there's assurance from the word of God. So let's dig, let's go in, let's see this. And I want you to be assured. So let's pray. And I'm going to go to the Bible and we're going to go to Psalm 69. Heavenly father, we do thank you so much for sending Jesus Christ to die for our sins, to provide forgiveness of sins through the shedding of his blood on that cross and for taking our sins away by faith. He went into the grave and on the third day rose again from the dead and he's alive so that we could see that we have newness of life in Christ Jesus, that our sins have been hidden, not buried and hidden like we're hiding something, but they've been removed from us as far as the east is from the west because we have faith in Jesus Christ. And we're thankful for that. We have the full assurance that he's going to fulfill everything in the word of God. and. We're living in that day now. So give us assurance now. Anybody who is alarmed or heavy laden or burdened down or to that point, they just feel like they're about to give up, give them strength and assurance now through the Holy Spirit, I pray and ask. And I pray it in Jesus' name because it's according to your word. Amen. Amen. Okay. Psalm 69, without further ado. Psalm 69. I love the title of this. It's an urgent plea for help in trouble. <laughs> you feel like trouble? You feel like you're in trouble? You feel like we're in times of trouble? You ain't seen nothing yet. And if you believe in Jesus Christ, you're not going to see it, but you understand the idiom. Okay, in times of trouble, plea for help to the chief musician set to the lilies. I would like to know what that tune is, but that's the tune. It's a psalm of David. Save me, O oh God. 
for the waters have come up to my neck. Waters. Now, we know from Scripture that waters, besides just being water, right? Just besides being water, water alludes to many things. Uh, Waters also allude to nations, peoples, the population, society, the culture. There's the water of the washing of the Word of God, which speaks to purity and cleansing cleansing and and, uh, life itself. It's signified by the Hebrew... uh, letter mim right the, the the pouring out of water and that's the shape of the mim by the way it's a it's like a a water pot being poured out oh my how does that connect to pouring out new wine not gonna go there but waters are uh, are seen in the book of the revelation where up from the seas or the waters the seas comes this beast that rises up so and the scripture says the waters that you saw from which the beast was rising up, are many nations and peoples. Okay, so David is here echoing something. He's saying, the waters have come up to my neck. I sink in deep mire where there is no standing. I have come into deep waters where the floods overflow me. So there's lots of things happening with this psalm. I am weary with crying. My throat is uh, is dry. My eyes fail. While I wait for my God. Now, that term eyes fail doesn't mean they're growing dim. It means they are clouded with tears. You know what happens when, when deep sobbing happens and, and tears are, are just overflowing everything? Everything becomes kind of cloudy and clouded up. And it's almost like the washing of your eyes through the tears that are happening. But when they're flooding, when you're in that flood, your eyes are, are, are clouded over and and that's what he is saying here that uh he's he's weary with that crying and his eyes are failing his his ability to see everything is failing because of the the weariness and the and the crying the the depth that is going on and his throat is dry because he's been crying out then he kind of gives some details here and and you you know this psalm i believe is going to have portions that are quoted later in reference to Messiah. The whole psalm is not necessarily messianic, but there are portions that are going to be used uh, by Jesus or in the uh, by the apostles as they're describing what took place with Jesus and um, or the writers of the gospel. Many ways, and they're in here, but. This is, this is David. I think David is standing in the place of Israel, standing in the place of those who are seeking God at the end when they are being drowned, when they are being overcome, when they are in the midst of many waters that have come against them. Okay? So, those who hate me without cause are more than the hairs of my head. They are mighty who would destroy me, being my enemies wrongfully, though I have stolen nothing. I still must restore it. We're living in a day when the the waters are rising up around us, and the waters are representing the evil of the world. So that which is good is now called evil. That which is evil is now called good. And so when you stand up for righteousness, when you stand up for good, even when you live it out, then you become an object of the enemy. Unjustly, not rightly at all, but Jesus said that would happen. He said, they hate me, they're going to hate you. The servant is not greater than his master. Okay, so we can't expect anything else. And now my wife said something this morning that was, uh, it it was, it was, uh, I mean, right on, right on. She said, (laughs) You know, even right here in, in this in Missouri, we're not in the inner city of Kansas City or of St. Louis. We're kind of up here, St. Joseph, Missouri, which is an odd place in and of itself. But we're all just living in this bubble right now where we feel the sense and the oppression of the enemy, where we sense the weight of the atmosphere. We see we, we see what's happening in the world, and we sense the battle that's taking place in the spiritual realms, correct? But we're not under, you know, severe and great persecution 
my thoughts were it could all change in a moment as it were in a twinkling of an eye but not in a good twinkle could it could all be taken away in a moment we all sense the oppression that is coming against the body of Christ in these days we we all sense that the dragon this is revelation chapter 12 that the dragon is poised before the woman who is about to give birth to the man child so that he can devour the man child and we we saw that sign nearly seven years ago. Do you realize? Do you realize that on the feast of wine or what we call new wine festival, that is to me is now fully revealed in these last days of unsealing. You can see it all over the word of God. It's 40 days from that unsealing. 40 days, and we're talking August 13th into the 14th, 40 days later is the seven-year anniversary of the Revelation 12 sign, which took place on (sighs) September 23rd, 2017, which many people thought, y'all nuts. Well, we're coming up on the seven-year anniversary of it. Why do I say all this? Because that picture of the Revelation 12 sign is of the woman giving birth to a man-child with the dragon crouching before the woman ready to devour the man-child the moment it is born. But the man-child is caught up before it can be devoured, caught up being harpazo, same word, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16. Y'all know this. So sing a song. I'm speaking to the choir, right? Right? So David is at this point where he's saying, I'm about to be devoured. I'm about to be destroyed. Those who hate me without cause are more than the hairs of my head. They are mighty who would destroy me, being my enemies wrongfully. I ain't done nothing wrong. Now, even in this moment, David goes back to his own sin. He, he, in, in his mind, I don't mean going back to sinning, but he's saying, oh, God, you know my, uh, my foolishness, and my sins are not hidden from you. Let not those who wait for you, O Lord God of hosts, be ashamed because of me, and let not those who seek you be confounded because of me, O God of Israel, because for your sake I have borne reproach. Shame has covered my face. I've become a stranger to my brothers and an alien to my mother's children. So even, even in that moment when the weight of everything is coming upon David, he he reverts back to kind of you know saying lord you know i know my foolishness i'm suffering through some of the foolishness that i've done i'm 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 living in in some of the results of my own sinfulness and 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 the the shame of that sinfulness we we revert to that in these days many many go back into a fearful state of saying i wonder if god's really forgiven me of my sins david is not saying that David is expressing the emotions of his heart before the Lord, that this is how his thought process goes. But we're going to see in the psalm that David understands that forgiveness it comes from God. And, and we have to understand that even though we may have, and we do, we all have sin, we have all sinned and fallen short of God's glory, Romans 3.23. And the wages of that sin is death. We know that, Romans 6.23. We, there, there is no one who is holy, none. No one. Jesus himself being the only one. So it's easy in the time of pressure. It's easy in the time of, of weightiness to, to start imputing our sins again to ourselves, and that's a lie of the enemy. That's what the accuser of the brother do, brethren does. That's what he does. He and, and our own hearts want to waver, but what did we just read? Don't waver, don't waffle, because our sins have been forgiven. And even in this walk that we walk through, we're given the resource of the Lord, a wonderful resource of acknowledging we're still in, we're still in these times where, where we're looking for the day of our redemption, and many have done great videos on this. We're looking for our day of redemption. It has not yet fully come, although we were are fully positioned with Christ in heavenly places. We're still in a body, and this body still hurts from time to time. It's not yet been changed. 
And our soul is still walking through that process of becoming Christ-like, putting off the old, putting on the new. But our spirit has been saved by the blood of Jesus Christ, by faith in Jesus Christ. It's by God's grace through faith. And we've been made alive in our spirit, and now the Holy Spirit dwells in us, okay? But we still walk in this world. Mud splashes on us, and we splash in the mud from time to time, and the miry clay. But all we do, all we have to do is turn to the Lord, confess our sins. It's a cleansing thing. It's a cleansing thing to say, yeah, it, and confession here means agreement. Lord, I know that is wrong. Your spirit is, is bearing witness in my spirit. That was a dumb thing to say, or that was, a, that was a wrongful thing that I just did. And you're agreeing with the Lord that that was wrong. What does he do? He forgives us, cleanses us, cleans us up. It's like taking our bath. It's okay to do that. In fact, that's what John says in 1 John. Talking to believers, talking to believers. Saying, you know, which one of you are without sin? If you say without sin, you're a liar. No, 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 he's talking to believers. And it's in, fa in the face of uh, Gnosticism, which says, you know, your spirit's saved, doesn't matter what happens in your body. Yes, it does matter what happens in your body. You don't want to walk around with a dirty body. No, a dirty soul. He says, but if you confess your sins, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness, the splashes of this world. Do you understand that? I hope you understand that. And so David is going through that moment where the accusers come against him, he, he's, against him, he's accusing himself, and, and so there's that down moment. Guys, don't go there. Don't go there and rehash the sins of your past that have, you've been forgiven by the blood of the Lamb. So David just comes out of that. Look what he says this, here. He says, uh, because zeal for your house has eaten me up, and reproaches of those who reproach you have fallen on me. Okay, so, so now he's, he's kind of changing direction here, and he's identifying with the Lord and the reproaches. Uh, the people reproach the, the, the Lord himself. Because the zeal for your house has eaten me up, and the reproaches of those who reproach you have fallen on me. When I wept and chastened my soul with fasting, that became my reproach. I also made sackcloth my garment. I, I, I became a byword to them. So he was, he's allowing their accusations to come against him in, in this way, and, and it's causing him to see himself as a reproach. He said, um, those who sit in the gate speak against me, and, and I am the song of the drunkards. Woe is me, gloom, despair, and agony on me. If it weren't for bad luck, I'd have no luck at all. All right, this is, this is the mode that he's in in this song. So he's singing about something he has gone through, and he's identifying with people who are doing the same thing. Many of you, maybe not many of you watching, but many people today who are believers in Jesus Christ are going through this and allowing themselves to be drugged down because they are forgetting that their sins have been forgiven. They're forgetting that God has separated from them, as far as the East is from the West, their sins. But there's a divine but here, right? But as for me, I love that. My prayer is to you, O Lord, in the acceptable time. O oh God, in the multitude of your mercy, hear me in the truth of your salvation. <laughs> in the acceptable time. Um, today's the day of salvation. Today is the day of salvation. Scripture says, today is the day of salvation. Do not harden your hearts as they did in the past. No, don't harden your heart. Open your heart because today is the day of salvation. And that's what David is saying here, the acceptable time. We are so close. I believe with all of my heart, every ounce of my being, could I be wrong? That's a good question. I'm, I'm wrong about lots of things. I don't try to be wrong about lots of things because a, of, a lot of times we speculate. I don't think I'm wrong that time is 
absolutely right now of the essence, meaning it is shortening. We're, we're coming to zero hour. We're coming to D-Day when it comes to the end of the church age. D-Day being the day of days. The start of the day of the Lord begins with the day he takes us home. I didn't say the seven-year tribulation starts then, but the day of the Lord. I don't think I'm wrong about it. Could I be? Yeah. I suppose. But my hope is in the Lord Jesus Christ, and everything in my heart is saying we are, we are careening, or at least the world is careening to judgment. We are, we are a breath away from our redemption because it's drawing very near. When you see all these things happening, when you see all these things beginning to happen, look up for your redemption draws. Line. That's how close we are, okay? So, this is the acceptable time. This is the acceptable. This should, to you right now, can I say this? Can I suggest this to encourage you? And that's all I'm trying to do here is encourage you. This is the acceptable time. This is the acceptable time. This is the day we've been looking for and longing for. This is, this is, uh, this is the crowning moment, can I say it this way? And Paul tells Timothy that there's a crown laid up for him. Crown of righteousness. Why? Because he has longed for the Lord's appearing. And, and we're longing. This is the day, this is the crowning moment. This is the crowning time. Are, are we approaching this feast and festival of wine or the time of new wine with skepticism? Or thinking, ah, oh, no, that's a bunch of nonsense created by a bunch of you guys who are just nutcases. Well, no, kind of the word of God standing out. And I, I know it's being poo-pooed all around the world by a lot of scholars, a lot of pastors, a lot of people saying, that's a bunch of nonsense, a bunch of nonsense. The, de the deeper you dig in the word, it's not nonsense. It's like, <laughs> it's full sense. Not fool sense, full sense. It makes full sense when you see it and study it that this could be the time. If it's not, the time is still very, very near. This is the time that is acceptable time of the Lord. This is the day of salvation. Praise God. So that's the next word that's actually used. He says here, deliver me, deliver me out of the mire and, and let me not sink. Okay, so I've got a note here that, uh, and I made this note, this is the word, this word deliver here is the word not saw. We've studied not saw before. This is, this is the word, same year, word used in Psalm uh, 124, verse 7, where you have, you have delivered me from the fowler's snare. Okay? It means to snatch, to rescue, it means to make escape. You have delivered me. So this is the infam infamous not saw. Uh, why won't you go away? Go away. There we go. Deliver me. It's it's what we looked at a, a week ago. And, and um, from Psalm 18, and, and one of the words for deliverance, Natsal, you delivered me from the waters. You, you, you snatched me out of the waters. You drew me out of many waters is another word. We looked through six different words. That was pretty cool. But here he is saying it, Natsal, deliver me out of the mire. Do you feel like you're in mire? And let me not sink. Guys. Generic term. Guys. You're not going to sink. You're standing on solid ground. You're standing on the rock, and the rock is Christ. You feel like you're going to sink. And there's mud all around you because there's water all around you and there's dirty dirt all around you, but you're on a rock. And even though you feel like you're sinking down, you're on a rock. You're on a rock. So he says, let me 
be delivered. So it's the same word. It's not Saul used twice in this one verse. Let me be delivered from those who hate me and out of deep waters. This is the separation again of the waters. It's it's the same separation idea of of, uh, coming out of the water, Psalm 117, going all the way back to to, uh, the the whole picture in Genesis chapter 1 of separating the waters from above and below. This is the separation of the waters. And here it is again. You, You divide us out. You deliver us out of deep waters. Let not the flood water overflow me. Let not the deep swallow me up. And let not the pit shut its mouth on me. I love that. The pit here being the picture of Sheol or the place of the grave. What was translated in the New Testament as Hades. It's the the place of the dead. One side, of course, in the story, I heard somebody say the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. Nowhere does it say it's a parable. Jesus said there was a man. So he's telling a story. There was a man. There was a rich man, and there was a guy named Lazarus. That's a story. It's not a parable. So in that story, he tells the story of this place that is Hades. And it was had two parts in it. One part was a place of torment separated by a great gulf, an uncrossable gulf, to the other side, which was the bosom of Abraham, otherwise known as paradise. And the one went one place and the other went the other, and there was no crossing in between. And the Lord descended to that very place, preached freedom to the captive. He took captivity captive. He took paradise away. I've taught on this before. Many others have taught it much better than I, but he took captivity captive, right? And now when you die, you're not going to that place of the grave. Your body goes back to the dust or ashes, however you, however you uh, ended it with your body. You left your body, or the, the dead person left their body. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And Paul teaches that. And he says, far better for me to go. I'd rather go and be with the Lord, but it's far better for you that I stay for that temporary time, because Paul had, from church history, had his head chopped off, (laughs) departed, went to be with the Lord. So this whole picture of David saying, the pit, let not the pit shut its mouth on me. It's not going to shut its mouth on you. And it really comes down to this, and, and this is meant for encouragement. If we die, we die. For me, To die is gain, but to live is Christ. That's what Paul said. To die is gain. In other words, I get there first. Are we waiting for the rapture? Yes. Are we longing for the rapture? Yes. Who who wants to die? But Paul's understanding here is just off the charts. To die is gain. To live is Christ. The dead in Christ will rise first. There's a thought. I told my congregation on Sunday, man, if, if I knew, if I knew the day and the hour of the rapture, even if I knew the day and what portion of the day that the snatching away would take place, what would I do? Well, well, I'd be kicking up and dancing and I'd be telling people, sure, but I would, I would pack up my wife and I and, and our, and our Artie the Wonder Dog, and we would head with our lawn chairs down to a cemetery 16 miles south of here. And we would, uh, we would sit down, have maybe a packed lunch, maybe some bread and some wine. I don't know. In preparation for the moment that the dead in Christ rise first, and we get to see our daughter again rise first, and I yeah, can just see her. I beat you with her new body. And we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So shall we ever be with the Lord. So therefore, encourage one another with these words. But if we die, we die. Still, we get there first. So David's picture here is pretty incredible. Verse 16, hear me, O Lord. Let me get this up here. For your loving kindness is good. Turn to me according to the multitude of your tender mercies and do not hide your face from your servant. For I'm in trouble. Hear me speedily, draw near to my soul, 
and redeem it. Deliver me. Here's it. Not all again. Deliver me because of my enemies. And so you hear the plea in his voice, but it's I, I think it's a shadow of the plea that's happening right now. Lord, deliver us from this water. Suck us out of the water. Pull us out of the water. Separate the waters. Separate us out. Deliver me. Pull me out. Draw my soul out to redeem it to the fullness. And, and the day of our redemption, when that happens, our soul is forever. Forever. Our, we're will be sinless our body will be new will be will receive the new wine and yet yes i know we've received the holy spirit already when you were born again but man the whole picture of putting new wine into new wine skins cuz the old ones will break i think goes beyond just putting the new covenant gospel into the old covenant law that that's major you can't do it it doesn't work you can't put the gospel into the law you can see the gospel coming out of the law, but you can't put the gospel in the law. They don't go together. You need you need a new wineskin for that, right? And so, but this body cannot inherit the kingdom of God. It, it's it's frail. It's weak. It's sinful. It's flesh. It's carnal. It's got all the. It's not gonna not gonna survive. It cannot. So the new wine of the kingdom of heaven that we're going to partake in that new wine of the presence of the Lord forever. Yes, that's a reference to Sandlot. You're killing me, Smalls. Right. Forever. We need something that's forever. We need a new wineskin for the new wine to be put in. Ooh, there's another connection to the Feast of New Wine. Let's continue on. I'm going to jump down just for time's sake here. Verse 29. Now he, he's, he's praying an imprecatory per, portion of this prayer, all right? Pour out your indignation on them. I think that's you know an appropriate prayer, verse 24. Maybe I better maybe, maybe I better read this portion of it. Pour out your indignation upon them. Let your wrathful anger take hold of them. Let their dwelling place be desolate. Let no one live in their tents, for they persecute the ones you have struck and talk of the grief of those you have wounded. Add iniquity to their iniquity, and let them not come into your righteousness. Let them be blotted out of the book of the living, and not be written with righteousness. Now, he's not talking about the Lamb's book of life being stricken out of that. He's talking about from the land of the living. He's talking about from the book of the living. In other words, kill them. And really, the, the picture here is he's praying that God would would um would pour out his justice on this evil evil wickedness now we we pray for our enemies do we not we we pray for those who despitefully use us we pray for those who are locked in deception and wickedness in this world today we pray that they would come to the light of the gospel of Jesus Christ and they would believe on the Lord Jesus Christ that's what we pray for but there's something in our hearts that's also saying, oh, Lord, please judge, please judge. But we know with that judgment, we know with that judgment is going to, is going to come great suffering and death. We know that. So it's, it's kind of a, a, a mixed bag. We want the Lord to pour out his justice, but we also want the Lord to pour out his grace. And, um, and so we see that whole picture there. Don't you feel that dichotomy? And, and, and I, I think that's what David is expressing here. But now let's go on. He says, but I'm poor and sorrowful. Let your salvation, O God, set me up on high. Poor and sorrowful here is kind of what we're going through. The, the poor in spirit. I'm telling you, the closer we get to whenever it's going to happen, the day of our blessed hope, I, I'm, I'm more and more aware of my utter worthlessness without Jesus Christ my the, the sins of my of my past the 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 I, I'm, I'm aware of that not in a sense of condemnation but in the sense that I deserve nothing I'm poor the Lord tells us that 
Blessed are the poor in spirit, right? Because they'll see God. The connection is understanding that you, you have absolutely nothing to offer God. But you. And your righteousness is utter worthlessness. And it humbles us to remember that. It humbles us to know that, that without the Lord Jesus Christ and his imputed righteousness upon us by faith in Jesus and his work on the cross and his resurrection from the dead and his ascending into heaven, knowing he's coming back for his church and then knowing judgment is going to be poured out on the world, the grapes of wrath are going to be crushed. Ooh, there's the grapes again. Knowing that kind of puts us in the same thought process here as David, but I am poor and sorrowful let your salvation. Now, this word salvation, this is the word, and not always is the word salvation. Lost my pen here. Uh, not always is the word salvation the word Yeshua, but this one is Yeshua. And the spelling of this word Yeshua uh has all of the letters of the tetragram- uh, tetragrammaton, the, the, the letters yod heh vav he, are all in this Yeshua. We kind of cut it off to make a transliteration, but uh, the salvation of the Lord is found only in Jesus Christ. So here, here he's saying it. Let your salvation, O God, set me up on high. Where was he? Where, well, go back here. He's in the mire. He's in the... The mire. The mire. I sink in deep mire. Sorry, I don't mean to make you dizzy. But he says, set me up on high through your salvation. It's by Jesus Christ. Jesus is coming for his body. The head is coming for the body. We will be united with him. One body, one head, one, one place. Did did you hear me? The head is coming for the body. I know we get, we really get locked into groom and bride. That, that is a picture. That is a typology. That is a metaphorical use of something that's very important because he's the head, we're the body. So the husband is the head of the wife, just like Jesus is the head of the church, so we liken the two together, and lest you think that gives you authority to rule over your wife and make her do what you want to do, remember he gave himself for the church. He suffered and died. He served the church. Okay, so don't go so weird here, but he's the head. We're the body. What's he coming to do? He's coming to snatch us away. We get a new body. And the whole body, think of it this way. I just thought of this. If we're all getting new bodies, then this is an all new body as a whole. One that can live in one place with the head. Wow. We all got to have new bodies. We all got to have new bodies. will be one new body. Ah, filled with new wine and the Holy Spirit. Fullness of the Holy Spirit. Can, can we handle? I know, wow, I had a thought this morning. Please forgive me. I have so, so many crazy thoughts. I had a thought this morning. Is You know, we have been, we've been given the fullness of the Holy Spirit. We can be filled with the Holy Spirit, right? We're supposed to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Do not be drunk with wine. Where is in his excess, but be filled with the Spirit. I don't know why I just went into that accent. Welcome to my world. Be filled with the Spirit, which is an errorist tense. It's a be being filled with the Holy Spirit. In other words, constantly being filled with the Holy Spirit. But we're only able to have a certain capacity now because we can't handle all of it. It not being an it. I mean the fullness of the Holy Spirit. He's a he, by the way. He is a he. But the fullness of the Holy Spirit. So what we have is just the, the 
the um, the down payment, right? It's it's just it's just the first fruit of what we're going to get. We have to have a new body to have the fullness of the fullness of the Holy Spirit. We have to have a new body, and we have to be one body to have the fullness. Of I can't imagine the. I has not seen, nor ear heard, nor has it entered into the heart of man all that God has a store in store for them that love him. This is deep stuff. Okay, it's coming. It's coming soon. So he says, um, I will uh, set me up on high. I will praise the name of God with a song. I will magnify him with thanksgiving. This also shall please the Lord better than an ox or bull which has horns and hooves, the humble shall see this and be glad. So that's all one phrase, by the way. The phrasing here, you know, this, this is a musical, a musical stanza. This is a phrase. So we're going to be praising God, magnifying him, and we do that even now. And this, is, this also shall please the Lord better than an ox or the bull. What is that? Uh, horns and hooves. Okay. The temporary, the horns and hook, hooves, the ox and the bull, the sacrifices, the law, they're temporary, right? And the magnifying of the Lord the, and, and the song of the heart comes directly from relationship. And we've already talked about how this being grace, we're saved by grace through faith, is better it's better, guys. It's better than the ox or the It's better than the law. The humble shall see this and be glad. It's the stiff-necked who have to stand on either, well, you're not obeying the Ten Commandments. You're not worshiping on Saturday, right? Okay, without an understanding, we're not locked into any of this. We're not locked into the law because we've been delivered from the law. The law demonstrated, showed, the sin, without the law, there's no sin, right? The law was in place from the very beginning. But God's mercy, God's mercy has been poured out. And so now we are delivered from the sting of death, which is the law. The power of death, which is the law. We've been delivered from that. And the humble will see it and rejoice. The humble will see it and be glad, saying, because we are saved by grace through faith, that not of yourself, it is a gift of God, not of works. You can't be saved by following the law. You can't be saved, delivered, redeemed. You, your redemption can't be by what you do and how good you are or how good you've done it. It can't be. And the humble will see this and rejoice. And that's where I was talking about saying, well, you see, we understand as we draw closer to the day, our utter worthlessness in and of ourself. But thanks be to God who is giving us, who has given us this living hope. Our hope is in Jesus Christ and him alone. And that makes us glad. And you who seek God, your hearts shall live. For the Lord hears the poor and does not, does not despise his prisoners. Huh prisoner. Is that where Paul came up with this? I'm a prisoner of the Lord. I'm held captive by the Lord. I think so. I think so. We're his. We're his. I am my beloved's and he is mine. Let's go on, finish this up. This is so cool. He says, let heaven and earth praise him, the seas and everything that moves in them. For God will save Zion and build the cities of Judah that they, they being Judah, all right, that they may dwell there and possess it, okay? So this is David talking about Zion and the building of the cities of Judah, that they may dwell there and possess it. Now, when David's praying this, the cities of Judah were intact and, and they'd already been built. So this is prophetic. They will build the cities of Judah. By the way, the cities of Judah are going to be crushed again. So is Jerusalem. It's going to be surrounded by, by armies. If you read and understand Zechariah, it's a huge portion of that city is going to be crushed. Women are going to be raped. Men are going to die. It's going to be terrible, terrible time. It's the time of Jacob's trouble before 
they realize and call out, seeing the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, calling out, mourning for him who they pierced. And when they finally call out to him, and we know what the scripture says, Baruch haba Bashem Adonai, when they call out to that one that they pierced, realizing who he is, and they call out to him, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, then he comes, we come with him, they're rescued and saved. But the trouble is going to be terrible. But the cities will be rebuilt, and who will dwell in them? The people of Judah. The people of Israel. Also, okay, here's the separate. Here's the separation. Also, the descendants of his servants shall inherit it, and those who love his name shall dwell in it. Who dat? Well, who dat? We, we know who that is. We are the offspring of Israel. The gospel came out of Israel. Jesus was Jewish. Jesus was an Israelite. Jesus was of the tribe of Judah. Jesus is our salvation. He came out of Israel. We are the man-child also coming out of Israel. So you had Jesus, the man-child, of course. Yes, yes, yes. But he wasn't about to be devoured and snatched up. No, there's a man-child that also is of that, uh, the seed of Israel. Okay? That we are. We're not Jewish, but we were grafted into the vine because of what came from Israel, and that is Jesus Christ. So we are grafted in as a wild grape into that vine, and uh, and we are we are joint heirs with Jesus. We're heirs of the Father, joint heirs with Christ. Hallelujah. So, but the devouring is coming very close, or at least the moment when it looks like the devouring is going to take place and the man-child has to be snatched away. We also, that's who this is, the descendants, the descendants of his servants, the descendants of his servants. Could the servants be talking about the, 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 the 12 tribes of Israel, the 12 sons of Jacob? Could be. Could be talking about the apostles who are also of Israel? Could be. Certainly, we're the offspring, so we will enjoy, all right, also the descendant of his servants, not just possess it, but inherit it, and those who love his name shall dwell in it, and I could break that down in several different ways. I won't do it because of time's sake here, and I know some of you are going to say, no, no, keep going. No, no, the, the point here is encouragement that we're about to come into the inheritance. And the scripture tells us that we also are the inheritance of Jesus on that day. The bride, right? It's the whole picture again. And, and then the whole process that follows. I know there's the process that follows of, of those who will believe on the Lord Jesus Christ during the, the tribulation and, and will be beheaded because they have refused the mark of the beast and refused to bow down and worship the image or his name and all of that. And then there's the, the full redemption of Israel at the end when all of Israel will be saved, according to Romans chapter 11. And we see that play out at the end of the time of Jacob's trouble. And this whole timeline before our eyes, I know the full inheritance is, is going to be at the very end. Yes, yes, yes. But we will come into that portion of the inheritance. And um, it's going to be absolutely wonderful. So be encouraged, even though we see the swamp, man. And I'm not talking about the political landscape. I'm talking about the miry clay, the nasty, stinking, smelly, dead world. And stop loving it. Stop playing in it. Stop loving it. And understand, the Lord is about to part the waters. We're about to be saved. Hallelujah. Not Saul saved, right? snatched, rescued, escaped. And the Feast of Wine is coming up. What is today? The 7th? Oh my goodness. However you calculate it, we're 6, 7, or 8 days out from that Feast of New Wine. Is that the day of the rapture? Can I say it this way? I hope so. I hope so. Do I know so? Not yet. 
He's coming soon. Be encouraged. You will not sink in the mire. So don't waver. Don't waffle. Stand strong. Stand firm. You can do this. Why? Because I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Philippians 4.13. Through Christ Jesus. Eyes up. Eyes on Christ. Eyes on the one who's the author and the perfecter of your faith. Can I get a witness? I know, I know, I know. That's a bad note to go out on, right? I love you all. God bless you richly. I hope I see you in the air real soon.